I am the herald of the lightning and a heavy drop out of the cloud. The question is a simple one. Did the humanists fabricate ancient Roman history during the Renaissance? But the answer, that's the tricky part. That's where the pitfalls and traps lie. That's where many, since the Renaissance, have muddied the waters. But that doesn't mean the answer is not a simple one too. And if you're someone like me, then perhaps one day it will really dawn on you and take your breath away like the overwhelming heat of a morning summer sun, rising towards its blood meridian. My soul is torn, divided. It was ripped apart long ago, before I was even born. It is not correct to call me schizophrenic, no. I'm lucid and rational but it would be appropriate to say that I experience a psychological dis-easement. An itch in my mind, you could say. A feeling of being pulled in two directions. Of being pulled apart by horses and torn down the middle. I am two people. My soul is divided. I am what you'd call a bastard child of colonization. A colonization that occurred in the mind and soul that dominated the psychology and spirit of myself and my people a long, long time ago. I am two minds, both Jekyll and Hyde, and I spend countless nights wide awake dreaming of the ancients, dreaming of Greece and Gaul and Rome. There are at least two sides to every story, at least two, and that old saying, history is written by the winner, although cliché, is very true. But what is it like to live out your days under the weight of a history written by the winner? What is it like to lose? In the beginning, before any rewriting occurs, you experience colonial oppression. A foreign entity has invaded and occupies your lands. This could be achieved through a mass physical invasion, or a more subtle invasion one carried out through the act of subversive ideology. Once it has invaded, this foreign entity begins to change your culture. They might even try to ban your religion and establish laws that prevent you from practicing your rituals. Most importantly, they will find a way to stop you from fighting back. Soon, they start to impose their culture and customs upon you. They burn your books. Smash your sculptures, tear down your places of worship, and erect their own over the ruins. You are under the rule and might of a foreign entity. It's only after a significant time passes and much is forgotten that the history books are rewritten. What was once a brutal act of theft and subjugation of an entire people is now reframed as a heroic act of triumph. A civilizing event, the dawn of a new age. What were once your beautiful mythologies, religions and unique cultural practices are now rewritten and forever changed. Your ancestors are now remembered as undignified, uncivilized, primitive. And generations later, many will read these histories, which were written by the winners, and they will feel glad that, once upon a time, a foreign power invaded their lands and saved their ancestors from such barbarity. But among the students of history, there will be those a little more in tune with the ancestral energies of the distant past. For these energies never die. They are always present, 
interwoven into the very cosmic fabric of this world, and the worlds outside of this one. History is not linear. It has no beginning or end, and the past and the future do not exist. There is only the now. And in the now of the distant past, your ancient ancestors, who you've never met and have no way of knowing, sing to you. And perhaps you cannot understand them, but they sing to you of your ancestral mother, that beautiful and maternal old world, a mother you never got to meet properly, and who was raped by your father, that foreign and cunning entity, and who conceived a bastard, you. And as a bastard, your loyalty is torn, divided. Who should you honour? Who should make up your identity, the father or the mother? For 2,000 years, Europe, that fire and beating heart at the centre of the world, has been under the subjugation of a colonial force, a foreign entity. For 2,000 years, this entity has continually and deliberately delayed and obstructed Europe's technological progress. It has done everything in its power to get in the way of Europe's manifest destiny. A destiny given and bestowed upon Europe by an elite subset of gods. It was this entity that was responsible for the erasure of much of Europe's history. And it did so in the most cunning ways imaginable. It is the destroyer of the past and the burden preventing the future. This entity is Christianity. Christianity was the vampire of the Imperium Romanum. Overnight it destroyed the vast achievement of the Romans. Can it be that this fact is not yet understood? To what end the Greeks? To what end the Romans? All the prerequisites to a learned culture, all the methods of science, were already there. The tradition of culture, the unity of the sciences, the natural sciences, in alliance with mathematics and mechanics, were on the right road. All gone for naught. Overnight it became merely a memory. The Greeks, the Romans. Christianity destroyed for us the whole harvest of ancient civilization. Sometimes it is necessary to state the obvious, but sometimes the obvious can be shocking and uncomfortable. Christianity is a Middle Eastern import. It is a foreign religion and was not cultivated and grown on European soil. Do you know what Christianity did to Europe? To the Roman Empire? To our ancient Greek heritage? To our Celtic heritage? Christianity did not civilise Europe like some history books may want their readers to believe. The Greco-Roman and Celto-Germanic worlds had sophisticated social and moral systems already in place. The winner is a pestilent liar. No, stop. I mustn't get angry. Although I do feel such a tremendous anger. Let me rephrase. The winner is a deceiver. Christianity robbed Europe of its ferocity. It subverted the Europeans' entire way of living and understanding the world. For its persistent moralizing and its insidious emotional extortion, Christianity brought the Roman Empire to its knees. The slave class, the weak, the abominable, they started to rise. They sought to subvert everything aristocratic, everything excellent, everything grand and powerful. The weak always want to be powerful and great. And to get what they wanted, the Christians spoke the language of equality. For there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. Feeling the pressure of these uprisings, Rome became self-conscious of its power. Perhaps it began to feel ashamed and guilty, and instead of casting the slave class back down to their rightful place, back to where they belong, 
Rome eventually bent the knee and tried to appease him. It succumbed. And as a result, it was overthrown and theologically conquered. And it wasn't just Rome, but the entire ancient world. Christianity is a beast that was born and nurtured in the desert. In the blistering heat, it grew like a fever. And when it came to Europe, it brought the desert with it. It began reducing the most advanced and glorious technological civilizations to ever exist. It reduced them to dust. It pulverized our ancient heritage into rubble and sand. It created a desert, a wasteland. Some have asked whether it is conceivable that Rome stood like this for over a thousand years. Naive fools, you don't know the half of it. Do you know how hard it is to keep the mob satisfied and at bay? A mob demanding equality. A mob hell-bent on revolution. That revolutionary spirit rose out of the sand dunes like the darkest djinn the world had ever seen. A powerful and spectral entity, and one that has haunted Europe since the fall of Rome. Many a time it has brought Europe to its knees. But equality would not be enough for them, no. The Christian revolutionaries started raging against the old pagan orders. They sought to tear down everything that the noble European aristocracy had painstakingly created over hundreds of years. They sabotaged and prevented Europe from achieving a very necessary technological mutation, which would have transformed and changed the entire world forever. This is what it was about, Christianity. It worked to prevent a technological shift that would have propelled humanity to its next evolutionary stage. You think Rome, standing like this for centuries, means that the Roman Empire was fake? That Rome never existed? No, no, no. Do not be naive. You've been listening to those that like to muddy the waters. The Roman Empire was very real. Oh yes, it's just that the version of it crafted by the cunning humanists during the Renaissance is not the full story. The story you've inherited is distorted and mostly lies with some fragments of truth in there. The true Roman Empire was far greater than you could ever imagine. I almost cannot bear thinking of it, of the enormity of what we lost. The blood in my veins boils every time I do. You've no doubt heard of the Colosseum and Parthenon, shining remnants of old pagan Europe. Ruins that hint at the once majestic and glorious civilizations of our ancestors. But did you know that those living during this time didn't write much about them? They were seen as the ordinary, the commonplace. But many did write instead of another structure. Ammianus Marcellinus said it was the most magnificent building in the whole world. Its splendour is such that mere words can only do it an injustice. No one has heard of it now, while tourists still toil up to the Parthenon or look in awe at the Colosseum, outside academia. Few people know of the Temple of Serapis. That is because in 392 AD, a bishop, supported by a band of fanatical Christians, reduced it to rubble. The Greek writer Eunopius felt the destruction was done less from reverence for the Lord than out of pure greed. In his account, the Christians weren't virtuous warriors. They were hoodlums and thieves. The only thing they didn't steal, he observed acidly, was the floor. And that was left simply because of the weight of the stones, which were not easy to move from their place. Nothing was left. Christians took apart the temple's very stones, toppling the immense marble columns causing the walls themselves to collapse. The entire sanctuary was demolished with astonishing rapidity. The greatest building in the world was scattered to the winds. And it gets so much worse. The Temple of Serapis was home to a vast library, the remains of the Library of Alexandria. Tens of thousands of books, 
the remnants of the greatest library in the world, were all lost, never to reappear. Perhaps they were burned. As the modern scholar Luciano Canfora observed, the burning of books was part of the advent and imposition of Christianity. A war against pagan temples was also a war against the books that had all too often been stored inside them for safekeeping. These wretched Christians, they stole our sacred knowledge, our Promethean fire, and they extinguished it. Make no mistake, Christianity destroyed Europe. It destroyed the greatest civilization mankind had ever seen. Many a biased scholar has told us that the Christians preserved ancient manuscripts in their monasteries. They make them out to be some kind of saviors. It isn't the truth. For before it preserved, the church destroyed. In a spasm of destruction never seen before, and one that appalled many non-Christians watching it, during the 4th and 5th centuries, the Christian church demolished, vandalised, and melted down a simply staggering quantity of art. Classical statues were knocked from their plimps, defaced, defiled, and torn limb from limb. Temples were razed to their foundations and burned to the ground. The remains of the greatest library of the ancient world, a library that had once held perhaps 700,000 volumes, were destroyed in this way by Christians. Works by censored philosophers were forbidden and bonfires blazed across the empire as outlawed books went up in flames. For centuries, the vast majority of historians unquestioningly took up the Christian cause and routinely and derogatorily referred to non-Christians as pagans, heathens and idolaters. The practices and sufferings of these pagans were routinely belittled, trivialised or, more often, entirely ignored. As one modern scholar has observed, the story of early Christian history has been told almost wholly on the basis of Christian sources. But look for a moment at the spread of Christianity from the other side, and what emerges is a far less easy picture. It is neither triumphant nor joyful. It is a story of forced conversion and government persecution. It is a story in which great works of art are destroyed, buildings are defaced, and liberties are removed. It is a story in which those who refused to convert were outlawed and, as the persecution deepened, were hounded and even executed by zealous authorities. The brief and sporadic Roman persecutions of Christians would pale in comparison to what the Christians inflicted on others, not to mention their own heretics. In the world today, there are over two billion Christians. There is not a single true pagan. Roman persecutions left a Christianity vigorous enough not only to survive, but to thrive and to take control of an empire. By contrast, by the time the Christian persecutions had finally finished, an entire religious system had been all but wiped from the face of the earth. The pages of history might overlook this destruction, but stone is less forgetful. But while some evidence remains, much has gone entirely. The point of destruction is, after all, that it destroys. If effective, it more than merely defaces something. It obliterates all evidence that the object ever existed. We will never know quite how much was wiped out. Many statues were pulverised, shattered, burned and melted into absence. Tiny piles of charred ivory and gold are all that remain of some. Others were so well disposed of that they will probably not be found. They were thrown into rivers, sewers and wells, never to be seen again. The destruction of other sacred objects is, because of the nature of the object, all but impossible to detect. The sacred groves of the old gods, for example, those tranquil natural shrines like the one Pliny had so admired, were set about with axes and ancient trees hacked down. Pictures, books, ribbons even, could be seen as the work of the devil, and thus removed and destroyed. Certain sorts of musical instruments were censured and stopped. 
One gleefully observed that the Christian emperors now spit in the faces of dead idols, trample on the lawless rites of demons, and laugh at the old lies. An infamous early text instructed emperors to wash away this filth, and take away, yes, calmly take away, the adornments of the temples. Let the fire of the mint, or the blaze of the smelters, melt them down. Those carrying out the attacks sang as they smashed the ancient marble and roared with laughter as they destroyed statues. In Alexandria, idolatrous images were taken from private houses and baths, then burned and mutilated in a jubilant public demonstration. It was not merely enough to take a statue down. The demon within it had to be humiliated, disgraced, tortured, dismembered and thus neutralised. The father raped the mother, tore down her home, and left her to die among the ruins. And now the bastard children of that dire event live out their days forever tormented by the divided soul they carry within their chest. We long for our long-lost mother, a mother we didn't get to meet. The Christians were adamant that the old ancient world be destroyed. They would have it no other way. In 356 AD, it became illegal, on pain of death, to worship images. The law adopted a tone of hitherto unseen aggression. Pagans began to be described as madmen, whose beliefs must be completely eradicated. In 391 AD, the dictator Theodosius passed dire laws. No person shall go around the temples. No person shall revere the shrines nor could anyone with secret wickedness venerate his household gods, or burn lights to them, or put up reefs to them, or burn incense to them. Then in 399 a new and more terrible law came. It was announced that if there should be any temples in the country districts, they should be torn down without disturbance or tumult. For when they are torn down and removed, the material basis for all superstition will be destroyed. It turns out that you didn't love thy neighbours as yourselves after all. The hypocrisy of it. In truth, there was only one Christian, and he died on the cross. You see, it was all a subversive trap from the beginning. The revolutionary entity was monomaniacal, and it wanted to destroy the old pagan world. And Christianity was the means it used to achieve this goal. You ask whether it is believable that Rome stood like this for centuries. Like I said, you don't know the half of it. The old pagan world and orders were far, far greater than you can even imagine. So much has been erased, lost and rewritten. Let me tell you what those tricky Renaissance humanists were about so you understand. You see, although most books of the old ancient world were destroyed and forever lost, There were some that survived, and some of the greedier Christians considered them the spoils of their victory, and they didn't destroy them like they were supposed to. They couldn't bear to let them go entirely. You find that with Christians. They can't help but dabble in a little paganism now and then. After a time, the books found their way into the monasteries, where they were kept secret. The humanists knew this, and they had a vision. They wanted their own technological revolution, one that would usher in an atheist world order. So they went hunting for these old manuscripts. Manuscripts relating to technology, science, engineering, mathematics and philosophy. The humanists dissected and isolated elements from each text And then once they had extracted what they needed to fulfill their vision of a technologically advanced future, they discarded the originals. A small percentage of the whole was selected and processed and then passed on. This is why Leonardo da Vinci and others had such bold and innovative ideas. They were all taken and adapted from old pagan records. The humanists then commissioned corrupt monks to rewrite these texts, to make poor copies. They asked them to forge realistic palimpsests, to reuse some of the old writings, and then they made sure that the originals were destroyed. 
Vitruvius's treatise on the practice of good classical architecture is an example of a rewritten ancient manuscript. It is a forgery. They extracted what they needed, and only what they needed, and discarded the rest. They not only used Vitruvius's treatise to revive an architectural style that would befit their new atheist order that they were creating in Florence, but they needed to paint a picture of what antiquity looked like in the minds of the masses. They needed the public excited and interested in the idea of antiquity and revivalism, otherwise no former Christians would have embraced their atheist vision. The problem was there wasn't much of the old pagan world left. Centuries of Christian desolation had almost levelled it all. But among the other ancient manuscripts were recipes for concrete. These recipes were extracted and absorbed into some factions of the Florentine and Venetian military. They guarded these concrete recipes with their lives and used them in secret to not only advance their military prowess and capabilities through the creation of bastion force, but they also created various counterfeit ruins. These ruins were then presented to the public as the lost and unearthed treasures of antiquity. Every fortnight there were new archaeological discoveries. Everyone fell under the spell of revival when in reality the military had created many of these structures themselves and buried them in earth. They were unearthing their own deceptions. This was all done to garner public support for their new atheist order, to encourage revivalism and humanism. For centuries, concrete remained one of the highest classified secret technologies in the European military. And thus the humanists trampled all over the remaining memory of old Europe. All they cared for was their vision of the future. They ran multiple criminal black market businesses. The Medici family and the Jewish bankers in Florence united and worked hand in hand, using young talent to produce counterfeit sculptures, which they would then pawn off as ancient antiques to gullible rich buyers. Their wealth grew and grew, their empire of deceit was rising, while the memory of the true, old pagan orders was becoming more distorted and corrupted. But the humanists were not like those early Christians. They were organised and collected. They were of a much higher breed of intellect and sophistication, and it's hard not to admire the way they exploited such talented artists and corrupted our understanding of antiquity. At least they had the nerve and intellect to extract what they needed and work towards some kind of technological vision. They were not like the blind Christians, who'd take to the streets like delinquents and tear down anything that didn't agree with them. And at the end of the day, who can blame the humanists for forging many an ancient ruin? For the Christians didn't leave them much to play with, did they? So much lost and all seemingly over nothing. It makes my head hurt. I can feel a pounding pain beginning in my skull. I fear I may be getting sick or worse. Do you know that I once found myself in a dream? I dreamt that the past was the future, that there once existed a vast, technologically advanced empire that spanned across most of the known world and was filled with the most glorious structures which were designed for the sole purpose of harnessing the very energy of the cosmos itself. I dreamt that my ancient ancestors had achieved this long ago, and that I was born too late, and that the future had already happened, and I missed it. But the dream was a lie. It was a what-if. For my ancestors, the Europeans, were on track to achieve this dream, to build heaven on earth to have the power to journey beyond this world to other worlds. But everything was squandered, interrupted, destroyed. All was lost before it could ever be. And why? Why was this course to greatness sabotaged? Because they had a king over them. And not just any king. This king. The Christ. The anointed Messiah. He was the king that conquered the old pagan nations. 
He brought them to their knees and cast them back into darkness, and the dream was lost. But what's lost and not found is not necessarily destroyed for good. The dream lives on. The dream cannot die. It is burned into the European soul. It is our manifest destiny, and make no mistake, it will be achieved. Our destiny was bestowed upon us from the very beginning, all the way back to the Proto-Indo-Europeans. Have you ever wondered why this symbol, the wheel of the cosmos, the wheel of the sun, ended up dispersed all over the world? Have you ever wondered why, throughout time, the Europeans always end up revering the sun above, and the stars and their changing courses? Why could that be? There are at least two sides to every story. Many centuries ago, Europeans respected and worshipped the natural world. They studied it, learned its rhythms and rhymes. They personified different aspects of the natural world into a pantheon of different gods. And by revering and studying the natural world, the European inevitably began to internalise and inherit its great vitalism, the force that drives all dynamic life, the will to power, to overcome the ever-encroaching threat of death and nothingness. And the sun above our heads embodies the very essence of this vitality more than anything else in this world. It is pure energy and strength, and without it, everything dies. No matter how much time passes, no matter what happens, no matter where he ends up, the European instinctively begins to turn his attention once again to the light above. He cannot help but cipher the luminous cosmos into symbolism. He cannot help worshipping the sun. Why? Don't you know? Because he is a child of the sun. And to worship is to study. There once existed an ancient text, far older than most, perhaps even the oldest, a living codex that many had added to and amended over the centuries. The Sarwell. It contained the writings from the elect of each generation. It was a book that contained the riddles of the sun. It preserved our oral traditions, which spoke of the prophecies surrounding the children of the sun. The Sarwalites. It is lost and has never been recovered, no doubt destroyed by Christians who were not refined enough to understand its contents. Thousands and thousands of books are now lost because of them, as are so many of the ancient languages which came before Egyptian and Greek. The Sarwell contained information relating to the origins of the Indo European and of their path in the future. What path? What destiny? That of the sun. Fusion. And not the pseudo-fusion you've become accustomed to, but true fusion. The wheel of the cosmos. It is written that the children of the sun will master true fusion and wield in their hands the vast power of the luminaries above. Powerful plasma that will accelerate the evolution of mankind that will finally allow man to leave this world, to break through the barriers of the beyond. It is written, and it will happen. And if it wasn't for Christianity, this would have been achieved centuries ago. All the prerequisites to a learned culture, all the methods of science, were already there. The Christians almost destroyed everything. And in a strange, paradoxical turn of events, if it wasn't for the church that rose out of the ruins of the old pagan world, then we would have truly fallen for good. The history of the Catholic Church is a corrupted one. We are not given its entire real history. It was fraudulently edited during the Reformation by Jesuits. The true history of the Catholic Church is actually a dual history of two very distinct but inseparable churches. Like the twin faces of Janus, there were two faces of the Catholic Church. 
The first face is the one you know so well. This was the front, the image, the facade. It was created in response to the uprisings of those early barbaric Christians. It sought to control them, to quell their desire for revolt, to extinguish their will to power. And eventually it became rich and powerful itself. It developed its own monastic and military orders, such as the Cistercians and Knights Templar. But the second face, or what was known as the Pale Church of the White Stone, was the face behind the mask. It was a shadow church within the more public-facing Catholic Church. In the beginning, the Pale Church kept completely hidden. It infiltrated the early Christians under the guise of Christianity and slowly gained power until it took complete control of what we have come to know as the Catholic Church. This was around the year 500. The Pale Church had its own hierarchies, sub-organisations and guilds, all of which have been written out of history by the Jesuits. If the narrative of the Catholic Church sometimes feels contrived, If it seems that there are inconsistencies and glitches, it's because the Jesuits later had to write out all instances that could be traced to the Pale Church. And they did it with haste, visiting monasteries, burning documents, amending and rewriting, all within a very short time frame. They had to. They had no choice. But traces of the Pale Church's existence are everywhere, and you know it. You just don't know that you know it. Have you not noticed that many of the early cathedrals, like the Romanesque and early Gothic, feature a lot of pagan carvings and symbolism? Have you really considered what these structures are trying to tell you? When the old pagan orders were conquered by the Christians, all pagan practices went underground. They hid themselves. They formed various different secret schools, societies and guilds. And although there were different denominations, they remained a collective under an elected governing body, the Pale Church. You see, no matter how much they tried, no matter how much they burned and destroyed, the early Christians couldn't completely eradicate the old pagan practices. A lot of knowledge and secrets were passed down through oral traditions. This is why the medieval cathedral stonemasons spoke an entirely unique language. This is why they had their own peculiar masonry symbols. It's called the language of the birds, or the green language. Green, like the forests. Falconelli called it Argatique, and Falconelli was a child of the sun and many of the alchemists were. Do you know what this language truly was? It's a secret code, carrying within itself cryptograms relating to the old pagan, technological, scientific, and mathematical knowledge. Since the year 500, the Catholic Church, the front organisation, was actually run by the Pale Church. Why do you think Mary became so central in Catholicism? The mother. She is the high goddess, the beautiful and wonderful matriarch. The earth mother from our old pagan ways, who sits upon the springs of the earth. The early Christians burned all our books and destroyed our civilizations. They hacked our sacred groves and overthrew our monuments. Their doctrine created a division in our soul, and so the European embraced this and cloaked himself in duality. On the surface, the Catholic Church practiced Christianity to keep any further revolts at bay, but it did not allow its citizens to read or own a Bible. No, of course not. It sought to protect its people. It conducted its own services in a language many could not understand or read. It did not speak of Christ as a historic figure, but as a principle, a personification of the Logos and reason itself. This was the mask. But underneath, the papacy, the priests, the elites, and the master builders worked within their real orders and guilds as true children of the sun. 
Every aspect of the medieval cathedrals is encoded with secret knowledge from the old pagan orders. This is how they pass their knowledge down and how they progress towards their goal. With each passing generation, new children were selected based on their excellence and aptitude. They were taught how to read the language of the birds. They were selected to carry the torch. With each passing generation, there were new iterations of the cathedrals, each progressing and building upon the work of the former generation. The paintings inside, the carvings, the proportions, the music, the symbolism, every millimetre of these cathedrals was cryptogrammatic. Everything was a key that opened its own door and led its student further towards the secrets. The green language. This is how the Europeans continued their project. How they walked their path towards the sun, towards true fusion. And it must be emphasised. Wait, no. My head. That's for another time. Now where was I? Ah, yes, the Pale Church. This is why the Protestant Reformation occurred. Let me explain. You see, as the humanists were scavenging through the final remains of antiquity to try and form their own atheist order, that revolutionary spirit that was born centuries ago in the sand dunes of the desert began to rise again. The entity. And this time it had a new cloak on. Protestantism. The enemies of the Catholic Church had their suspicions all along about the Pale Church. They could see the cathedrals for themselves. They knew they were up to something. They had plotted to overthrow and expose the Pale Church for centuries. And they tried many a time. And always failed. The Catholic Church had amassed too much power. And it was only after the Black Death, which saw the demise of over a third of Europe's population, that this entity saw an opportunity. The Black Death weakened both the Catholic and Pale Church's defences considerably, and allowed the entity to make its move. And it almost worked. It came close to destroying them completely. The Protestant Reformation was nothing more than a quasi-communist uprising, designed to obliterate the Pale Church. History is full of ironies, and in protecting its children from reading the Bible, the Catholic Church had unknowingly created its own weakness, its own Achilles heel. The invention of the printing press put the Bible back in the hands of the everyday people. Suddenly, many could understand the dogma, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And so the Christians did what they do best when under the influence of scripture, they started revolting. It was during this time that Europe saw uprisings like it hadn't seen since the early days when Christianity sought to overthrow the old pagan orders. The hoodlums, the hypocrites, once again took to the streets in an iconoclastic fever. Brainwashed by their newly printed Bibles, the Christians once again destroyed centuries worth of heritage and progress. They tore down cathedrals, emptied them of all art, smashed icons, and covered many of the cathedral and church walls in whitewash and plaster. These structures were once painted inside, and the paintings told many stories, a lot of which that did not align with the Bible you know so well today. The whole point was to destroy the green language. To destroy the coded knowledge and prevent the return of the old pagan orders and the fulfilment of Sarwell prophecy. They did their best to destroy and change these structures as much as possible. 
so much so that the language is now terribly fragmented and extremely difficult to read. And trying to decipher what remains of the cryptograms today means entering a labyrinth so complex that there is no guarantee you will make it back out. It was because of the Reformation that the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order, was created. The Pale Church knew that they were now completely vulnerable. The Protestant movement caught them off guard and nearly cost them everything. The time had come for them to shed their skin and retreat into the shadows. The original Jesuits were commissioned to ensure that any hint or suggestion or slightest piece of information pertaining to the Pale Church was written out of the historical narrative. They managed it by the skin of their teeth. The great schism between Catholic and Orthodox churches was a product of Jesuit rewriting. Both denominations mutually agreed to the separation during the Reformation. It happened much later than we're told, as another front to protect and preserve whatever secrets they knew. If you read early church history, you will notice that all of Christianity's critics have been silenced. That's why the work of Celsus simply disappeared. Not one single, unadulterated volume of the work by Christianity's first great critic has survived. Almost all information about him has vanished too, including any of his names except his last. This was, again, the work of the Jesuits, for those early critics were children of the sun, and said too much about the old pagan orders that could be directly linked to the Pale Church. They have never stopped looking for the Pale Church. Don't sit there and tell me you cannot see it when looking at the cathedrals. The Pale Church of the White Stone and its green language. Without the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages, Europe would have perished forever. It saved Europe. And they have done their best to corrupt this church now. The Jesuits were soon infiltrated after they completed their mission, and Catholicism is no longer what it once was. For a long time there were rumours that the true history of the world was locked in the underground chambers of the Vatican. And they weren't entirely incorrect. It's an old half-truth. For a more accurate chronology of events was written down at some point by the Pale Church, and kept in the vaults of the Vatican. But this was centuries ago, and only chronology. They didn't dare write down a single piece of information that was coded into the cathedrals. For so long, many thought the Vatican was hiding the truth in their vaults, and keeping it from them to remain in power. But they were not. They were guarding it, under the order of the Pale Church, for they knew that the entity would rise again. The Chronicles were moved just before the Enlightenment, and, just like the Pale Church itself, no one knows where to. Some say the Pale Church fled to America, some to Malta. Others genuinely thought they remained in North Europe, primarily England. The House of Hanover were obsessed with finding the Pale Church. And Operation Capability Brown was there doing, and they nigh on turned England upside down looking for traces of them. Others, such as the Freemasons and Rosicrucians, began to manufacture many a rumour about a group they called the Children of Solomon. They rebranded the Pale Church as an esoteric, Abrahamic myth. They adopted and appropriated many symbols relating to the Sarwell and the celestial light above. They did this to pollute the memory these symbols contained. They did it so the people would associate light worship with evil and esoteric nonsense. They did all of this to tarnish the Pale Church's legacy forever. To cast them as something satanic and to use the idea of them as a scapegoat if they ever needed to. But I digress. If the invention of Christianity was the first major setback for Europe in achieving its manifest destiny, then the Reformation was the second major blow. All the knowledge that had been carefully written into the cathedrals, it was all there. They were the books of stone, the stone Sarwell. Instruction manuals meticulously carved from rock, 
all carefully crafted to teach our future children, to teach them the secrets of the sun, the cosmos, about the waters beneath the earth and the telluric currents that pulse through the ground, to teach the future generations so we could regain our true purpose and once again walk the right path towards finishing the great work, the path towards the light, towards true fusion. And now you know. Now you can see why Christianity occurred. To corrupt mankind's techno-scientific advancement towards greatness and true liberation. There are at least two sides to every story. At least two. And that old saying, history is written by the winner, although cliché, is very true. Make no mistake, Christianity was the winner. It raped and then killed our mother. And of course there's more to the story, but I'm tired now, and my head hurts. I must go. I fear that I am getting sick, or worse. And I fear I've said too much. Repeat none of this to anyone. Just keep it close to your heart, for I feel the battle is far from over, and he will return soon, wielding the sword of revolution once again. How many of our children understand that their soul is torn and divided? How many will naively open their arms and embrace their father when he returns? And believe me, he will return. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dim tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out, when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow fires, while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born.